Our aim at the center is really to engage in, um, in interdisciplinary research and teaching, as well as public outreach like this one. And what we're trying to do is really eliminate disciplinary silos um, because that's what we need today for public understanding of science and society. And we need this in terms of the climate um, situation, the climate uh, crisis especially. It's such a complex phenomenon um, that it needs to be explored from many disciplinary and practical perspectives. And in fact, this series was really inspired by the founding of the Climate School um, at Columbia last year. And this new school serves as a hub of interdisciplinary research, education, and practice, practice focused on climate and all of its related challenges. So um, we are trying to bring together people to combine their expertise in social and human behavior, in culture, in politics and policy, economics, communication, and many, many other areas. So now I'm, I'm delighted. I'm really delighted to introduce our two speakers today. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Rhiannon Stevens, um, who is an associate professor of history who specializes in the history of pre-colonial and early colonial East Africa from the late first millennium CE through the 20th century. Very long period of time for a historian. Um, she's written on the history of motherhood and marriage in Uganda from the 8th to the 19th centuries, including in her monograph, A History of African Motherhood, The Case of Uganda, 700 through 1900. She's the co-editor of Doing Conceptual History in Africa, which critically examines what it means to write conceptual history on the continent. Her upcoming book, Poverty and Wealth in East Africa, A Conceptual History, traces poverty and wealth as economic and social concepts in Eastern Uganda over the past 2000 years. Last year, she had a Mellon New Directions Fellowship, a very distinguished fellowship, which allowed her to complete an MA in science and society, in climate and society at, at Columbia, um, which is a wonderful thing for a, a historian to do. Um, and now she's working with our second speaker, um, uh, Dr. Jason Smurden, who is a Lamont research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and co-director of the Earth Institute's undergraduate program in sustainable development. Those are both at Columbia University. His research aims to characterize and understand climate variability and change on multi-decadal to centennial timescales, again, long timescales. His recent work has focused on hydroclimate variability and change with an emphasis on the droughts, the multi-decadal droughts in North and South America. He's a prolific writer, publishing dozens of academic papers in the scientific literature. He's the author of Climate Change, The Science of Global Warming and Our Energy Future, and a contributing author on the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So I'm just thrilled to welcome both of our speakers today, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Pamela. Um, thank you to those of you in the room for joining us and uh, to everybody on Zoom. So um, what we're going to do today is talk a bit about our uh, recent collaboration, our, our first collaboration um, that is focused on a late 18th, early 19th century drought in East Africa. Um, and so, uh, the way we're going to do this, we've divided this up roughly between the two of us. Um, so I'll talk initially about historical perspectives on um, East Africa back to the 18th century um, and on the drought in particular. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the different sources and the ways that we can um, access information about this history in a context where there are no written sources before the very end of the 19th century and frequently before um, the 20th century. And then Jason will take over and talk about reconstructing climate over the common era, um, and then specifically about common era climate reconstructions in East Africa. Um, and um, then move on to talk about thinking particularly about multi-decadal droughts in new climate reconstructions. And then we'll take a step back and think about where we go from here, um, the kinds of questions that we're asking as we do this research, and then we'll have time for a discussion. 
thinking about um, historical perspectives, there's this long-standing recognition of a late 18th, early 19th century drought across, in particular, across the bimodal range region of East Africa, so a region where you have um, two rainy seasons um, in the, it, obviously in the tropics, there's no summer and winter, but you get these two rainy seasons, a short rainy season and a longer rainy season. Um, and this event of the late 18th, early 19th century is long recognized by historians of East Africa as an event of some significance. In the 1960s and 1970s, several historians in a turn towards a sort of a, a reinvigoration of African history in the aftermath or around the turn and in the aftermath of independence, the wave of independence from colonialism on the continent, there was a lot of focus on recovering pre-colonial histories um, as part of a, a big exercise, big effort to, to write African history, um, in particular in the face of Eurocentric um, arguments that Africa had no history outside of the colonial um, period and the arrival of Europeans. And so part of that involved a lot of research on oral traditions. And in East Africa, these, this research revealed that in many of these oral traditions, there were connections between um, this period of drought and famines in different regions, as well as um, the migration of communities into new areas and political changes of different scales and different um, impacts. So for example, that could be very minor. It could be just the arrival of a stranger in an area um, who was escaping famine, who then led to that that's the descendant of that stranger um, who was accepted and adopted into the communities, founded a new chieftaincy or a new polity. It could also be a much larger transformation with the, the collapse of a political system and the emergence of a new one. Because oral traditions don't have, um, are not written down and historians are, are generally much more comfortable with written sources that can be easily dated. Um, whereas oral traditions collected in the mid to late 20th century about events that happened 200 and more years earlier and not anchored in time in the same way. There is a problem with dating and with understanding the scope and scale of the drought. So people might remember that there was a drought or they might remember that there was a famine, but being able to really um, map that and understand the number of years that it lasted um, and its severity is, is harder. Um, so a number of early efforts at dating, at dating depended on things like cross-referencing the reigns of rulers. So if the oral traditions from one society mentioned a ruler in another society, then you could cross-reference those and at least have a relative chronology. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Um, also using generation sets. And so in many communities in East Africa, people are um, uh, at, at different moments, well, people become members of a generation set, generation set through a period of, through an initiation process, um, frequently um, in late childhood, what we would think of today as late childhood and that they stay in those age sets that, and, and those, through those age sets, they migrate through different generations and those are often named. And so again, by assigning a particular amount, a number of years to one generation set, then it becomes possible to try and get an estimate um, for when an event happened, but it's always a very rough estimate. Um, but we can also, so we can also, but it isn't clear that there, there was something that happened. And so we can see different kinds of historical changes um, that suggest a long-term, but not permanent change to the climate that people experience. So for example, to people living to the Northeast of Lake Victoria started to live in fortified villages. So they would, rather than living distributed across the landscape, they moved into more centralized villages that had either a moat or a, a wall built around them. Um, and this is indicative clearly of high levels of insecurity, um, but we can connect that insecurity to 
um, tensions that emerged as a result of, of scarcity that might have come out of a drought, um, but also the consequences of this move to a fortified village meant that women who were doing most of the cultivation had less space in which to cultivate. And so that in turn ex accentuated the um, lack, the food scarcity that people experienced. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what oral traditions can tell us, at giving some specific examples. Um, and then I'll also give brief examples of what we can tell from generation sets and um, archaeology as well. So this is um, from an oral tradition, a set of oral traditions collected in the 1960s and 1970s from a, a smallish community in Eastern Uganda. Um, and so this is just a quote from that. This Matiama didn't attack Bugwere so much, but Teso and other places which didn't keep plantains. When these people from neighboring counties came for help with food, they didn't go back, but stayed here and settled. That action of staying here and not going back is called Kutiama. There was another famine called Bukwikwi. This Bukwikwi was the food that they used to eat. It is yam-like, but grows above the ground. Plenty of people died during that famine. And so this gives an ex as a good example of the naming of famine and how it is that people remembered these kinds of events, but also that they were not all the same, right? That, that people distinguished between the different famines. And most, one of the things for me as a historian trying to sort of pull all this together that's most exciting about this kind of text is that um, people in one area rem remembered a famine that happened in a different area because even though it didn't affect them, they directly, they experienced um, the consequences of it through migration. And so th this is another, um, oral tradition that referenced the Matiama famine. Um, and this one is important because it names political leaders. And so that helps us give dates or it helps us begin to date or to at least have a sense of when this happened. So the famine Matiama came during the time of Tongo Kuiri towards the end of his ruling. And that famine mostly affected those parts of Teso and Bamanito. So that when those people used to come to search for food, they brought their wives with them and Batiamu was settled. And then clans, which like mostly came from Teso to settle during this famine, they were given settlement by Laki Wagawera because he was the one who knew their language and because he had much food so as to feed them. And so this both tells, gives us something to anchor in time um, through the naming of particular rulers, but it also gives us some insight into the process of migration. So there was an earlier um, person who had migrated who was then, so that is Laki Wagobera, but because he could speak to the new migrants, they knew him, they, they had a, an affinity with him or a, a connection with him, then more people were able to come and more people were able to settle and they remained in the area. So then the oral traditions in those two slides were from Bugwere. Um, but there are also traditions collected from Teso, which was the area that was affected by the Matiama famine. And there, it, Teso people remember it as a famine called La Faranat. Um, and one of the things that they really remember about that period is that the Teso people lost nearly all of their livestock. And um, Teso people, their society um, or their economy was based both on keeping livestock and also on agriculture. But livestock and cattle in particular were very culturally significant. Um, and so this famine has been dated or was dated back in the 1970s by a historian who used the he counted generations back and assigned a number of 27 years per generation in order to get an estimate for when this might have happened. Um, and so even though that's a rough estimate and there the the neatness of having a particular number is not something that is factually correct. I mean, even if we think about US presidents, right, you might think, oh, yes, you can easily count back four years of rain for um, four or eight years for each one, but some only last a year, right? And so even in something where we have a lot of documentation, the idea of assigning a number is, um, is complicated. So that's even more complicated when we don't actually have um, 
written documentation. But we can match this up to the famine in Bulgaria, so we at least start to get some um, correlations between different societies and start to be able to get a sense of when things were happening. So this is a, um, an example of possible drought caused political events around the same time, and this time from Western Kenya, um, from Bwanga in Western Kenya. Um, and this is a nice example because it complicates any conclusion that the impacts of drought can be simply reflected, refracted along lines of economic specialization. Like we could say that it was because the cattle died and they were more pastoralists that the Itesa were most affected. Here we have a very different example um, in which um, in these oral traditions collected by historian Gideon Were, um, he recorded that in the reign of Nabongo, the ruler um, Nabongo Wamukoya Netia, um, the Abawanga, the people from Bawanga, faced pressure from neighboring communities. They were being attacked and raided. And so they decided to, um, or he decided to create an alliance with a pastoralist community from further east, the Wasan Bishu Masai. Um, and the Masai offered them protection and helped them in the raids from their neighbors. But then the, the Maasai started demanding more and more payment. And so that then created um, tensions within the community. And when Wamukoya Netia refused to pay, they killed him. And so that was the end of his reign. Um, and so there's a, uh, a sort of the souring of that relationship led to a, a political transition. But here we can see that the, the, the Wasingishu Maasai didn't disperse in the face of this drought. And of the threat to their cattle, but they instead move further west and use these alliances to try and um, to thrive, basically, at the expense of agricultural neighbors. The next reign um, of Namongo of Osundwa is remembered as a period of prosperity, and then the following one is remembered as one of famine, civil war, and hostile neighbors again. And this is an, an important clue, too, because it suggests to us that this multi-decadal drought wasn't a single event, but that it could have been punctuated in the middle. Um, and that's something that Jason will be talking about. So then um, moving on to um, the use of generation set names, historian David Anderson has looked at this in um, the Baringo Bogoria region of Western Kenya too. And what was interesting for him was that the earliest generation set name that he could find he using again the sort of counting back and assigning an approximate length to each one dated to around 1830. But there's also this clear archeological evidence that there's much older presence. Um, so using that, he understood, he sort of framed that as 18, around 1830 as the period that marks the beginning of time in this community. And it's the return of pastoralist communities to this area. Um, after the ending of the drought. And so he uses the dating of, so he, count, he dates that by counting generations and also drawing on some of the paleontological research that's been done on lakes in that area. Um, but, so, and this is archaeological, sort of a, a case from archaeological evidence from also from Western Kenya, from among the Pokot and Marikwet, who are people who um, have, um, have long had elaborate systems of irrigated agriculture and who live in the hills, not down on the plains. Um, and they experienced pronounced dry periods, but were able to survive, come through those, not only come through those well, but also to accommodate refugees from places that were more badly affected. And particularly, um, it seems that they were able to accommodate displaced pastoralists, perhaps even those that were displaced from Baringo. Um, and so the points, this, I guess, um, points in particular to the utility of a regional approach to studying this and not just focusing on one specific society. And we were talking um, before we got started about the question of scale, right, and how you go from the global to, to the very local. But there is also a value in a regional approach that looks across a number of different societies because we can see that the way an, a climatic event affected one community may not have affected all of them in the same way. And so it's important to have that perspective. 
and in particular to be able to understand the variation in the ways that people responded. Um, there's a lot of, understandably perhaps, but it's sort of a simplistic, I'm thinking about how people responded in the past to, to climate, climate events like this. And so understanding in a much more nuanced and complicated way is important. All right, I'm gonna stop now and hand over to Jason. I don't know if you're all as excited as I am to be here, but Rhian, and this is kind of our coming out party. Uh, we've been working on this collaboration now for almost five years now, believe it or not, I think. Um, certainly before the pandemic, uh, we have a long way to go in terms of the research that we're doing. Uh, we've brought an increasing number of people on board uh, to this project and fostered, I think, a lot of interesting discussions um, and have worked to find funding, which has been slow, but we're making that happen with time as well. And so it's fun to finally be here presenting um, are the discussions that we've been having in aggregate to try to share with you how we're thinking about these problems and how these things are going together. So from my perspective, I wanna give you a sense of what I do and how I come to this problem and give you a sense of how those things are, are coming together um, based on the presentation that Rhiannon just uh, gave you. So I'm a paleoclimatologist and I focus specifically on the climate of the common era. And that's a specific and unique paleoclimatological interval. There is paleo uh, that's done on much longer time scales, but this particular interval is one where we have very high resolution records. So seasonal to annually resolved records um, and enough of them that we can do reconstructions over large spatial scales, which is, which is if you're trying to understand the climate system is very useful in terms of understanding the underlying dynamics and so on. And what I think is useful about this time scale from a, a climate dynamics perspective is that we can answer questions about how the climate varies over decades to centuries and at global scales. So that's important for understanding climate dynamics on those time scales, as well as putting the past over the last several thousand years in the context of where we're going. And obviously the climate problem has taken on um, newfound significance as we continue to alter the composition of the atmosphere. So these are just an example of the kinds of records that we have. The reason why they're high, high resolution, annual to seasonal resolution is because they put on in most cases, annual layers, tree rings are the iconic example where a tree ring puts a layer on each year. Um, corals do that. There are cave formations, ice cores, lake sediments, all these things put on banded layers. But in the case of something like a tree ring, you have absolute dating where you can actually go back by counting the rings to specific years and place those um, in an absolute time chronology. Whereas some of the other records, things like ice cores and sediment cores, you can get close to that, but you're using different time points using things like C14 dating to place them in time, but you still get banding that allows you to break time up um, into fairly highly resolved records. And that, that evidence decreases back in time. So the two pictures that I'm showing here, the map on the left is, I guess I can use my corner, um, is of the most replicated amount of data that we have for the common era time scale. Um, presently, if you go back to 500, you can see that a lot of those symbols have disappeared. Uh, this time series is showing how the composition of those records changes back in time. We have a lot of tree rings, which is this um, pale uh, red color here. Early in the record, those tree rings fall out in time and we're left with more sediment records and things as we go back in time um, over the common era. So as we go back in time, there's more uncertainties, different kinds of sampling, and we have to accommodate for all of that. But what it allows us to do is create pictures like this. So this is a global reconstruction of soil moisture on the continents and sea surface temperature uh, temperatures over the oceans. Uh, if you're curious, this is actually a composite of a response to large volcanism over uh, the last millennium that we've put together. The point is, is that with those records and given their um, their abundance, we can actually come up with global or large sort of continental scale uh, reconstructions that are resolved in time. So this is a, a gridded product where we have, um, we have estimates in lat lawn uh, bins of about two degrees lat lawn in each of those locations. So this is very useful for looking at different climate dynamics problems over these time scales. Okay. I want you to understand a little bit about how we do this because it's relevant to the products that I'm gonna show you. And I just wanna use this slide. Unfortunately, the Zoom is covering it a little bit, but to communicate two really powerful ideas that have come about in climate science over the last half century, let's say. The first is the idea of teleconnections. And, and, and that's the idea that 
there is a spatial covariability in the climate system. The temperature here in New York is related to the temperature in upstate New York, is related to the temperature in Connecticut. And so if you have a measurement of temperature in one place, it tells you something about the measurements, uh, about what the temperature would do in other locations. Um, and so what I'm showing on the left is some temperature patterns that represent the leading spatial patterns in a field. And so to get to that, I want you to understand the other thing that's hidden partially by uh, the zoom screen here, but it's the idea that we can take a geospatial field, something that's resolved in both space and time, and decompose it in, using matrix factorizations that allow us to write it or represent it in terms of spatial patterns, which I'm showing on the left as U, and then on the right, the temporal variability of those patterns in time. So this is going back now, the last millennium, and these things are paired. So that pattern on the left at the top is the leading spatial pattern, and this is how that pattern on the right here varies in time. And what the pattern actually represents is sort of a, a mean uh, variability in the field. So you can see that it's mostly spatially heterogeneous. That represents a sort of mean variability in the field. And this temporal pattern represents different forcing of those mean conditions, like the spikes you hear that see here that represent volcanic events that move the mean of the global temperature up and down with that kind of forcing. The second pattern is associated with the El Nino Southern Oscillation Period, and you can see that red blob in the Pacific Ocean that really ties a lot of this variability to how temperatures in the tropical Pacific Ocean varies. The middle variable here, the uh, sigma, is the weighting of those patterns in the field. So the variance explained represents the percentage of the spatial and temporal variability that the spatial pattern and the temporal time series explain in the overall field. So that first pattern explains more than 30% of the variability in the spatial temporal field using this decomposition. The second pattern represents uh, just psi of 6%. Six, 6 so collectively with just those two leading patterns, we can explain almost 36% of the variability in this geospatial field. So that's using the idea that there is spatial uh, connections in the field that's very powerful, and the fact that we can break things down into these leading patterns such that we can explain the large majority of the spatial and temporal variability in the field with a few of these leading patterns is really important for how we do some of these reconstructions. So the way that we do these reconstructions is to create a data matrix. So on the left, the big question mark represents the data that we want to reconstruct in both space and time. The gray area here is what we call essentially the training interval, the, the interval for which we have observational data like temperature. And that might go back 100 to 150 years. And so everywhere you see gray is, is a spatial point in time with temperature values that go back a certain amount of this, let's say 150 year interval. The proxies, those banded proxies that we have overlap with that temperature data in the area of overlap where you see the blue and the gray overlapping. And the basic idea for how we do this is you've got, you've got measurements like tree ring thicknesses, right? So that's not a climate variable. You need to convert that into a climate variable. And the way that we do that is by relating the overlap period in the proxy network with the instrumental data and essentially do lots and lots of regressions to estimate how the proxy and temperature co-vary. And once we have that relationship during the period of overlap, we can fill in that part of the data matrix where we don't have any climate data, okay? So it's kind of like a net, we, this is very analogous to the Netflix problems where you watch a few movies, you give them a rating, and then Netflix can tell you what you're gonna think about all the other movies. It works sometimes, and the more that you rate, the, the more that uh, their predictions are accurate. The problem with this data matrix is that it's an underdetermined problem. We've got lots more spatial locations than we have temporal periods of overlap. So it's what we call an underdetermined problem. And so we have some options when we actually want to do the completion of that data matrix. We can reconstruct less information so we can reduce the fields that we're targeting to a few of those leading patterns, which is the way that a lot of us do it. We can also reduce the information by just targeting places in the field where we feel like we have the most success so we can reduce the number of spatial locations that we're targeting. So in that sense, we're reducing the amount of information that we're trying to reconstruct. The other thing that we can do is add information. So instead of reducing the information, we can add other things that we know about the problem. And one way that we do this is to get back to this picture is add model information. So this is actually a product that we arrive at by combining that overlap between the proxies and the observational data 
and then include the kind of information about the geophysical variability in the climate field that we would estimate from a global climate model. So this is, this is one where we add information from a global climate model to help us fill in a lot of the areas that we don't have. So I'll talk a little bit about using this uh, in the context of our problem in a second, but another powerful way of doing this has been developed by Ed Cook at the Lamont uh, uh, Doherty Tree Ring Lab. Ed is the one on the left. It's my favorite picture of him. His wife gets him lots of self-deprecating t-shirts and this is one of them. This is him in Bhutan. But Ed for many years has developed um, this reconstruction method for doing drought reconstructions over continental areas. And the reason why he's developed it this way is because we're interested in, in an hydroclimate variable that has less of that spatial um, consistency than a variable like temperature. And so thinking about it as a local problem where you're trying to go grid cell by grid cell um, is the way that Ed has approached this problem. He's called it the point by point regression method or PPR. But the idea is that you go to one grid point, you've got a big tree ring network like the, um, is represented here with um, red triangles. You pick your grid point, you take a search radius, you ask how many trees are in that search radius, you do a regression between those trees, you may reduce the tree ring network a little bit with a matrix factorization, but you do a regression on that grid point, you see how you do. If you do well, you say I have a reconstruction there. If you do poorly, you say I can't reconstruct that grid point, you move on to the next one. And so you build up a gridded network of, in this case, soil moisture reconstructions derived exclusively from tree rings over a continental area like North America. And Ed has done this in lots of locations. This is, I like this slide, it's actually been updated, but it really shows you that sort of reduced information approach that Ed has taken. So everywhere where you see blue and red filled in here are locations where Ed has completed drought at atlas reconstructions. They all have this sort of, of nada, mata, outa uh, uh, nomenclature because it's the North American drought atlas, the old world drought atlas, et cetera. But you can really see how these reconstructions have been restricted based on where the data allows skillful reconstructions with this very locally constrained approach doing things point by point. You'll also notice that over the Mata region, the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas region, the grid cells are bigger than some of the other locations. And that's because when Ed did this reconstruction in uh, 2010, the amount of data available didn't allow him to go to a finer scale. Whereas some of these other reconstructions are half degree by half degree reconstructions, the MATA is degree by degree as far as its resolution. And so you can restrict the information both in terms of the grid cells that you're reconstructing, as well as the size of the grid cells that you're targeting. But Ed has been building up this network through these reconstructions over time. He now has uh, Eurasia completed. We think we can push up into um, tropical South America, maybe complete Australia. But you'll notice that an area that's clearly underrepresented is Africa. And the reason that it's underrepresented is because we don't have a lot of high resolution proxy data specifically from Africa. So this is just one compilation of the available proxy records for targeting the common era. Now, this, there are other people who have done these assessments. Um, the details aren't so important. The main takeaway is that there's clearly geographic biases in where we have data. And now each symbol represents different kinds of data. So the most well-represented network is tree rings. And this is specifically for temperature, by the way. So for temperature reconstructions in the States, we've got a lot of tree rings in the Northern hemisphere, basically none through the tropics, very few represented in the Southern hemisphere. The Southern hemisphere generally is poorly sampled. The um, ocean regions are poorly sampled. What you have mostly in the ocean regions are the orange dots, which are coral sites. Um, but over the continent of Africa, we have basically no tree rings. Uh, very few continental records, um, and mostly what we have are corals and sediment records around the continent. So from the perspective of high resolution proxy reconstructions were very data limited, similar to the historical problem over uh, the African continent. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Those, those are actual end numbers, right? The, the, number, the number of records yeah. that are in this yeah. network. So this network is just shy of 700, and what this represents is uh, a community effort to look at all the available high-res proxy records and um, what are useful and available for temperature reconstructions over the common era. Uh -huh. These 
these span different time scales. So for instance, corals as a record only give you a couple centuries. Unless you have fossil cores that you can constrain in time, corals only live a couple centuries. And so when you core corals, you can only get um, on the order of several centuries into the past. Uh, so lots of details within this map. But the main thing that I want you to take away from this is that we have very limited high res data over the African continent to actually do these reconstructions. So that's true to a point. What we do have from Africa is a lot of lake records. And so one of the things that actually got, uh, Rhiannon and I started on this collaboration is Gilles de Court was a visiting postdoc uh, from Belgium. And he came to work with me for a year. He's a, a lakes expert and specifically an African lakes expert. And he came to um, work on trying to um, use the lake records to make some of these spatially con uh, consistent and gridded reconstructions using some of the techniques that we've developed. Um, but this is his compilation of lake records available in Africa going back about uh, 50,000 years. So even longer time scales, Pamela. But what you can see is uh, the color coding here are, uh, for, is for resolution and time scale. So if you look specifically at this, the peak in the very first bin, there's a lot of lakes available for the last several thousand years. Um, that have higher resolution that can be used for this problem. And a lot of them come from things like the Rift Valley region uh, in East Africa. You can see a lot of concentration there. Um, but there's for a long time been a lot of climate reconstruction work that's been done over longer timescales, but also the last several millennia using lake records. So by far the most established community doing proxy reconstructions generally specifically for hydroclimate, but also for temperatures, is within the lakes community and specifically over Africa. There's lots of people that have been working on this problem. So lake data are very powerful, but they have their limitations. So this is just an example of different lake records coming from different lakes um, throughout East Africa. Here's Lake Edward. What you're seeing is the, uh, I don't know how well this pointer is working, the, the solid, or uh, black lines in these reconstructions are the mean estimates. The gray bands around these lines represent age uncertainties. So these lake records, in order to anchor them in time, use deposits within the sediments using things like C14 dating to anchor them in time and actually give uh, time scales for the distance of the amount of time between different layers in the, um, in the sediment. And that's an uncertain dating method, at least uh, by measure of being able to anchor things specifically from year to year. And so for the lakes data, you see that the time anchoring is more uncertain. And you also see in a record, record like this from uh, Lake Navasha whoop, that the resolution is less than annual, right? So you're seeing these kind of decadal or centennial periods that are estimated in this record. Compare that with a coral off of the Kenyan coast, Malindi uh, area, and you can see that high resolution, how it compares. Some of the large scale features, this uh, coral, when it's cold, it's dry. When it's uh, warm in this region, it's wet in East Africa. You can see this trend here. You can see that in Naivasha. You can see it in Lake Edward. So on time scales that are comparable, uh, you can see some consistency. But these lower resolution records that aren't as well resolved in time have their challenges, despite all of the um, useful advances that they've made in terms of understanding things like um, hydroclimate history over this, in this case, the last thousand years in places of Africa. But in terms of thinking about higher resolution reconstructions, we have to think more about how we can compare to this well-established work around lake record reconstructions in Africa and how the lakes measure different things. So the reconstructions that I was showing you from Ed target soil moisture which is one component of the moisture balance of the surface. A lot of these lakes are measuring, and, and also um, seasonally, uh, what we've targeted in those um, reconstructions is June, July, August soil moisture, which in a bimodal region of Africa like this might be suspect. We've looked at the seasonality and have to do more to understand that. But these lake, lake records are integrating more time. They're not really measuring um, soil moisture as much as they might be measuring evaporation or uh, precipitation in different ways. And so thinking about those different parts of the hydrological cycle in our comparisons also makes 
that kind of comparison very tricky and difficult and something that needs to be thought about carefully when we do this. And this gives you an example of um, some of those uncertainties. So this is an analysis that Antichrist and Tierney did, um, wow, almost 10 years ago, uh, using some of the lakes in uh, the network that G's put together. And what I've done is highlighted 1800 right here. So the droughts that Rhiannon was talking about were late 1700s, early 1800s with potentially a punctuated wet period in between. And you can see that all of these different lakes, what, what these bar plots are showing is the frequency of dry events year to year in this collection of lakes. And um, the reason why it's done probabilistically is because these age models can be Monte Carloed and, and estimated many different times to account for the uncertainties. And when you sample across all the different possibilities that are consistent with the age modeling, you get these histograms. But what these histograms are showing, if you, if you look at 1800 here, the line that I've drawn, some of these lakes or a lot of these lakes are showing aridity um, in the 18th century. Some of that extends into the 19th century. Some are showing multiple events. So like Victoria is showing two events um, that aren't centered around 1800, but that do appear to be there. Whereas if you look at Naivasha, you can see this much more um, consistent dry period that extends over a century or more. And so when we think about what these lake records are telling us is the fact that we get different responses in different locations because these locations are different and they're measuring um, different expressions of these droughts in space. Are they smearing out events in time in a way that has to be, um, has to be deconstructed and, and looked at? Uh, are they measuring different components of the hydrological cycle? And that's part of this. Lots of uncertainties. All of them are consistent with some dry periods and extended dry periods uh, going back as far as the 17th century, but around this 17 uh, to 1800 year period, uh, but that has to all be worked out. So lots of space and time uncertainties that may be inherent to the record on one hand, but also inherent to the climate system in terms of the spatial expression of these droughts and um, the seasonality of these droughts and so on. So um, what about drought atlases? over East Africa. I've already told you it's very poorly represented in terms of tree rings and records that we have over Africa. Um, I've shown you one product, which is this data assimilation product where we've incorporated model information to help fill in a lot of that space uh, that we don't have direct measurements for. But one of the, and, and we've looked at that and, and that's a product that we still need to explore more in terms of uh, what it's saying about these droughts over East Africa. But we've also been working a lot with Ed Cook to develop these drought atlases, high resolution drought atlases over the East African region. And so the first thing that we've started with is what Ed is calling the Great Eurasian Drought Atlas or the Gita, and uh, then something much more specific to East Africa. And I don't, yeah, you can see the stippling here. So uh, in the upper left, the red stippling represents the Gita domain of reconstruction. So all the grid points in the Gita, these are half degree grid points. And then in this, uh, this African uh, plot here, the gray stippling represents where Ed has targeted the East African drought list, drought atlas or the EDA. What he's done on the left is used teleconnection. So you can see the tree ring distribution in the absence of tree rings over Africa, but used the idea of teleconnections to try to fill in this domain um, in Northern Africa here that extends down into East Africa. What he's done in the center plot is again targeted that domain using the tree rings in blue, but also tried a local reconstruction where he's incorporated other uh, proxy information, corals, sediment records, uh, cave records to try to target that domain. And so what I want you to understand here is that uh, this has been an exploratory process. We've thrown a lot of different data at it to try to get to a sense of how well it all agrees, how, how it all looks together. And part of what we still need to do in, in testing all of the accuracy of this is doing a lot of comparisons and assessments to know whether or not what we're looking at is at all reliable. But one of the interesting things about thinking about historical comparisons is we can actually look at the historical data as a, as a form of a validation. So what I'm showing here is a large box average over East Africa from the Gita, 
And the black line in the larger plot is the year-to-year -year variability of soil moisture uh, variability in the Gita. And then the, the smooth curve is a filtered version. And the two periods that I've highlighted are two drought periods in this reconstruction that happen to fall very much during um, some of the historically defined periods that Rhiannon was talking about with an intermediate pluvial period that separates these two prolonged drought periods. So if you squint your eyes and you look at this and you think about the historical data, there's already what looks to be some agreement that we have to further test. But an interesting feature of this, this average is that we do get drought events during those periods using this far field teleconnection approach. The inset here is over a smaller box that's more centered on the bimodal region over Uganda and Kenya. And what you can see is those two drought periods are still there. They're actually deeper. So as you, as you focus down regionally, it looks like these droughts were more severe through this region and actually more severe relative to some of the other events. You can see that these two droughts were severe in the larger box average mean, um, but comparable to some other events on either side. These two drought events, at least by this estimate, would have been significant in their anomaly relative to what, for instance, some of the local cultures were familiar with um, over the preceding, say, several centuries. So that's an interesting thing to look at. What this is effectively saying is when you have a spatial reconstruction like we've created, not only do you have that time component, but you have the patterns of variability to look at. So what I'm showing here is the two average drought regions in the upper column, and then that, that pluvial inter, intermediate period down here on the bottom. When you look at the patterns in the Gita more collectively, first of all, there's some really interesting um, climate dynamics implications about how the intertropical convergence zone might be varying, how monsoons might be varying and all of this. So I think some really rich discussions to look at in terms of the climate story here and what might actually cause droughts to exist over this region on the order of multiple decades. But when you dig into, and so this inset of the drought period here, when you dig, dig in specifically to the region that we're interested in, you can also see some really interesting heterogeneity in this more finely resolved spatial estimate of drought over, in this case, uh, the bimodal rains region of Uganda and Kenya. And you can see that, you know, depending on where you are, and let's, let's wave our hands and say that we don't believe these spatial patterns uh, perfectly yet, but you can already make up a story about what it might be like if you were living in, for instance, that very deep brown area where the droughts are more pronounced to an area that actually wasn't experiencing much drought. If you look at the um, pale blue color here, um, just to the west of that region, which might have very important implications for things that Rhiannon brought up, like migrations and um, other factors for the areas that were impacted by this. So there's a lot of power in getting the spatial resolution here uh, in what we can say about the climate, but also the kinds of stories that we might be able to tell about um, the history in the region. So the last thing I want to leave with you, you with is, again, this question of validation. There's some traditional statistical ways of assessing validation. So we always leave some of the training data out, do um, validations on the data that we've saved that don't go into the reconstructions. And we can do assessments like validation R squared here is just the correlation coefficient squared, which tells you about the variance of the grid cell that's explained. So if you look over Africa, we're not doing as well where we have data, for instance, over uh, parts of Eurasia, but we are explaining, let's say, 10 to 20% of the variance in some of those locations in a statistically significant way. So the, the map is white if it's not statistically significant. Not as light as, as much as we typically would like to see, uh, and I think we have a long way to go, but we can do statistical validations. But there's a lot more that we can also do. So those are what I would call traditional validation approaches. We can compare across products to see if we're getting the same story across all these different methods that we're throwing at the problem. We can compare with other proxies. So we can compare with the lake records and see if this is all consistent as far as that goes. We can start comparing with historical evidences, which is one of the real powerful, this is done not just between Rhiannon and me, but the, the you know, comparison to historical evidence is a very important way that a lot of people validate um, their reconstruction methods. I don't think it goes far enough in terms of um, useful collaborations between climate scientists and historians, but it is one way in which the historical data has been used in the context of these last millennium reconstructions. I'm happy to say more about that later if you want to hear more about it. And then we can also look at the patterns and how these um, these reconstructions estimate the, the climate to be varying and ask, does that make any sense at all? Is it consistent with the other things that we know to be going on in the climate system at this time? Um, and so dynamically and physically, 
is the story that these reconstructions are telling um, one that makes sense to us physically? And I would just point out other, which is there's lots of other ways that we could probably come up with to think about validating this. And it's part of a discussion that we should have um, when we think about using these reconstructions in the context of historical, historical data and other ways that we can ask whether each of the information sources are telling us something that's, that's um, useful and potentially accurate. Okay, so that's the end of my bit. What I wanna do now is actually just go through some of the questions that we have in mind going forward. Rhiannon's gonna come up and, and talk about a few more and then we should have plenty of time for discussion. So from my perspective, the things that you know, remain for me in thinking about this problem is how reliable are these new reconstructions? Uh, we have these global reconstructions, but I think there's a lot of potential uh, through the work that we're doing with Ed that's really been motivated by this collaboration to provide some really high resolution reconstructions of drought over parts of Africa that have been very poorly represented in the paleoclimatological um, research areas, specifically on these very high resolution time scales. So we've got a lot to do to just decide whether or not what we're coming up with is reliable and useful with lots of different comparisons to make. We're really, we're both really interested in understanding how these reconstructions describe those 18th and 19th century droughts um, in space and time. What kind of interesting stories are they gonna tell us about the, the influence of those droughts locally um, on the societies of the day, but also what are they gonna tell us about the dynamics of the climate system, which gets me to my third question, which is, I'm really interested in what causes multi-decadal decentennial variability in the climate system. To get that kind of variability, you either have to force it with things like solar variability, greenhouse gases, volcanoes, or you have to create internal variability in the climate system through interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean to actually get that kind of variability on those time scales. So what kind of variability causes multi-decadal droughts in East Africa? And I should say also that it's not a question that we can answer principally with the observational data, because if you're looking at multiple decades, the 100 to 150 years of data that we have at best is not enough for sampling lots of events. So this time scale allows us to actually look at events um, over much longer periods and actually get more insights into how these things might occur. So once we understand that multi-decadal variability, what are the implications for the future in a warming world? What kinds of changes might we see in this multi-decadal variability in addition to the kind of force change that we expect from greenhouse gases into the future? And what are the implications for where a region like East Africa is going? So with that, I'm gonna let Rhiannon come up and talk about uh, the last three questions and then we'll have a discussion. Thanks, Jason. So yeah, so looking at these last three questions, um, thinking more from the historical pers perspective, so what would better certainty about timing, scale, and scope of droughts allow us to understand about historical development? And so a few things to think about there, they would, sort of at a very basic level, they would allow us to better understand the connection between historical events and climate events. And from that, start to get a more sophisticated understanding of how people responded. And there to really start to move beyond the very simplistic narratives about collapse, um, but also beyond the slightly less, but simplistic, but still not all that you, well, not completely useful one of resilience, right? The idea that you either you collapse or you're somehow resilient. Um, and then we could start to turn to some theoretical models that come from archeology, span like the idea of mosaics and the way in which different local specializations um, allowed people to survive and to accommodate each other and to um, temporarily take in refugees, for example. And that's something that we can access um, by historical linguistic data as well as oral tradition. So if a community was absorbed into a different community, you can see that in the, in the language um, and changes in words that people had and so on. So then um, how can we use historical sources with such high uncertainty in terms of dating to make sense of the paleoclimatological records? And so here, you, partly you just have to be comfortable with like uncertainty and the fact that there's a lot that we can't know, but just because there's a lot we can't know, it doesn't mean we try to figure out all that we can know. Um, and the important lesson there is that we just really have to be very careful in both directions. Um, part of our motivation for looking to other disciplines can be to get an easy answer to a problem that your discipline doesn't answer. Um, 
but here we realized as, as soon as we started talking to each other that in fact like we were both facing some of the same challenges um and so the the question is how do we work our way through those um and and realizing that the reality is both messier but ultimately more interesting um and then finally what can we hope to say beyond it's complicated <laughs> which is something like historians say we need more nuance we need to get into more details but it's not also all that satisfying so um one thing to think about is if we can get to a place where we have at least slightly better certainty around the timing um then that opens up the possibility that we can develop a set of fairly detailed examples of how drought affected different communities how people responded and not just between communities but even within a single community so one of the things thinking back to the matiama la paranat example of that drought that is remembered in in two different sets of oral traditions is the fact that the reason it's remembered among the cheso is because not everybody left right so in response to that drought many people left and moved to somewhere else but not everyone did and so understanding that range of variation gives us a much more detailed understanding both of what happened in the past but also hopefully can inform how people think about what the impacts of climate change are going to be in the future and how people re will respond because east africa is a place that is already experiencing um pretty clear impacts of climate change and we don't really know how things are going to play out and we obviously won't know but we can at least have better um understanding of what might happen and with that we'll move to discussion so let me ask you just a very specific question. You know, I, I'm not sure how many um, data points that when I asked you, are those actual absolute numbers of data points, whether those are all the data points for that region or whether those are, that's just a sampling, but like you had one bivalve piece of evidence, for example, and it was off the coast of North America, I think. Like, what does that get you? I mean, how do you think about that piece of evidence in the larger picture? Does it mean anything? It can. I mean, from a statistical perspective, if you're throwing anything with signal into the problem, it will improve the results that you're getting. But where that uh, is not true is that there's a lot of over a, a short calibration interval, you can get lots of things called artificial skill, where you can kind of deceive yourself in the calibration period. Uh -huh. um, and and such that you're not going to do as well outside of it. Um, but what, what the community has done, and the map that I was showing you, is the history of this large-scale reconstruction work is a kitchen sink approach where one scientist like myself decides, I'm going to throw all these things in and get a, a, a result. Mm -hmm. The community sort of pushed back against that, and the pages effort that compiled that map that I show you said, we're going to take a lot of the domain experts who work in these different areas, and ask them what the most reliable data are for this problem and kind of assemble a collection of curated data. And so what that actually represents is a curated collection of data where a lot of people within the different communities have said, these are good records to use, this is what should be used in this problem. Yeah, so, um, and then I'll let you speak, um, Rhiannon. Um, so one of the things that seems very important in your modeling is the teleconnections, right? And the question, my question would be, how much have you examined or how much data do you have for the assumptions that you make about teleconnections um which seem like it could be filled with assumptions but it might be filled with data i just don't i mean actual measured data that wouldn't probably go back very far but so we've done a lot of artificial experiments with this you can use climate models to create essentially create the conditions you have and see how uh these methods perform uh -huh. and news flash you do best where you have data um yeah <laughs> so, so it's surprising how much of my career I've spent proving that. But um, then there's a question of what the what field you're trying to reconstruct and where you do have the data. So depending on what the actual spatial patterns in the field are, you might have a piece of data in one location that's much more powerful. Like if you have a, a record from the tropical Pacific, that's going to get you a lot because of the influence of uh, ENSO globally on temperature and hydroclimate variation. Whereas um you know another location so, you, i'm sorry the el nino southern oscillation uh, yeah the, you know the tropical pacific has a huge influence on global climate 
so it really depends on what the the large scale teleconnections are in terms of where you need sampling and where you need. Right. But th there's been a lot of work, you know, even so if I told you based on the observational record, you need data here, here, and here. The other complication is that the teleconnections change in time. Yeah. So we make this assumption that in, in many of our reconstructions that they're constant back in time, but we know they change. And so that's another aspect of uh, the uncertainty. Yeah, thank you. Great. So uncertainty. Yes, I think I'm probably an outlier as a historian. Um, <laughs> but a lot of that is because the work that I do, um, because I work in a part of the world where we don't have written records before the late 19th, um, early 20th century. But there's a lot of history that's been going on for you know much longer than even I work on. Um, in order to access that history, I use comparative historical linguistics, I use oral traditions, I use evidence from archaeology. But the historical linguistic evidence, um, that what that entails is um, identifying which languages are descended from a common ancestral language and then taking modern vocabulary and using the principles of linguistics to reconstruct the vocabulary that was spoken by the people that spoke those ancestral languages. Um, and so that I mean, that's all in some sense hypothetical because we don't have any attestations for what people were actually saying or how they meant. So it, it's, it's based on well-established principles, but it's not um, the same as finding a document in an archive. Right. right, it's the same sort of modeling that right. you have to give some rigor, some, some sort of um, unrealistic standardization to like a generation is 27 right. years, yeah. Right, and then even then, you know, if I if I identified that the a, a community speaking a language created a new word or changed the meaning of a word, yeah. I can only say you know probably in this five hundred year period. I can't say yeah. when. And so this, yeah. I've, I've just been doing that my whole career. And mm -hmm. so coming to this is a different kind of uncertainty. Yeah, but it's very not interesting. Something that I'm uncomfortable with. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's very really interesting. Um, so we have a question in the chat, which actually everyone can see. Um, but uh, it, it speaks to the questions around what your proxies are, basically, I think, Jason. And this is something that, which is, um, has Jason looked at whether local deforestation would affect late, late sedimentation and whether this accounts for the temporal differences in peaks of sedimentation? And this reminds me of one of the articles that we read in the climate um, history uh, reading group in which, you know, the question was how long does it take a lake to fill up, you know, when it, if there's a large rainfall and it has to go, you know, the watershed moves the water, you know, along at a very, um, at a slower rate, it may ta be talking about, I don't know, some number of years even prior when you had the actual Lake. So anyway, the question is, there's so many factors there um, that uh, might affect lake sedimentation or might affect, you know, um, height of the lake, um, if that's the way you're measuring it. So I'm not a lakes person, uh, and I don't study the, those proxies in detail, but I will say that, you know, the, the sedimentation isn't exclusively the proxy that are used. So often it's different things that are found in the sediments that can tell you about um, vegetation if you're counting pollen or people will analyze leaf waxes and the isotopes contained in those leaf waxes. So there are uh, proxies that are used in the sediments to tell you about vegetation that might tell you something about deforestation as well. Um, and so when, when these proxies are analyzed or when these sediments are analyzed, they're typically not analyzed exclusively, say, for sedimentation, right? Although in some cases that might be done. But then within the sediments, there's lots of other things that you can locate and find that allow you to paint a more complicated story and, and actually answer some of those questions in ways that are useful. Um, I want to take, I also just want to back up because I, I, in this question of uncertainty, the thing that I still find remarkable and that we should not let go by is what Rand and I have showed you is many different sources of information that have pointed to droughts in the late 17th, early, or uh, 18th century, late 18th, early 19th century. And I, I, I have to continue to marvel at the idea that, you know, some dude interviewing people in the 1960s came up with some dates, and of course, lots of other things um, from the historical work has identified those as dry periods. And then you can come along 
and take a bunch of trees from the Mediterranean and parts of uh, North Africa and, and, and other parts of Eurasia, do this statistical reconstruction and, and come up with events that align very well in time with those historically estimated dates. And I, I think that's remarkable. I mean, when you think of it from the philosophy of science and the importance of replication, that's an amazing thing to do to take information sources that's so disparate um, and actually show that there's consistency across them. Although it's also very powerful in terms of confirmation bias, but that's another whole story, which I'm sure you, you must think about a lot. Tell me how you think about that. Well, that um, when you find something that seems powerful, especially if it's counted and measured, um, it seems even more, I mean, something that powerfully confirms your evidence, um, even if uh, it's largely constructed through modeling. Well, I, so one person's confirmation bias is another person's validation. I would say that we did not do those reconstructions to recreate those droughts. So those, yeah. there was nothing about those droughts right. that were part of the way that we did the reconstructions. Now, where confirmation bias might play in is we, we're looking at some points of agreement, but there might be other points in that time series and in the historical data that don't agree so well. And I think that would leave us yeah. with um, you know, some important um, yeah. questions to ask. But the, I, I think that confirmation bias in this case is not as strong a, a criticism in the sense that we did not we didn't approach anything about yeah. this problem that would have required the outcome to be yeah. droughts in those periods. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Are there questions in the room? I feel like I'm monopolizing the floor here. I do have other questions. <laughs> We're getting towards the end of our time here. Um, the thing that I want to ask you is, um, you know, I thought it was interesting that you both started with your data and then got to your aims at the very end, the questions you were asking, because that was the question I was going to ask you, like, why are you both doing this? What is your, what is your aim? But you did also um, talk about, um, you know, the stories we might tell from this. So you're both telling narratives in, in a very important way, I think, and that's a very strong um, kind of driving principle here. Um, but I wonder also whether, you know, one of the things that you're looking for that I think that the historical information, you know, in conjunction with the um, scientific data um, might tell us, and I think you alluded to this, are the alternative paths of, you know, in a way, being in the world in crisis, right? And um, so alternative paths of response um, that people took in the past that might in some way inform us about human behavior today. And I just wonder if that's a useful way of thinking about this kind of interdisciplinary work that it is about you know, trying to understand how humans were in the world in the past or you know, in a different place um, that can tell us something about you know, our own situation. Yes, I think that's a conversation that we've had a lot. Um, and from the, because so the conversation we have is that like the climate scientists want to be able to project the future, and the historian in me is always like, well, we don't know anything about what the future is going to look like. Um, but we do know that the past was, you know, complicated and a lot more complicated than is often assumed to, to be. And yeah. we know a lot more about this part of the world than is often assumed as well. So an even earlier example that comes from the work of um, someone who recently got his PhD at Northwestern, William Fitzsimmons, looking at around the turn of the end of the first millennium and start of the second millennium, further north in South Sudan, the way in which people responded to uh, what seems to also have been a very prolonged dry period is that some people turned to um, transhuman pastoralism and became really invested in transhuman pastoralism. So migrating uh, with the seasons, with their livestock. And other people decided, no, actually what we're more interested in doing is continuing to grow crops. And so they moved south um, into a new area where there was more rainfall. And so it, we don't have a lot of detail, but we know that people made radically different decisions mm -hmm. in the face of the mm -hmm. challenge. Um, and that I think is important. Like we, mm -hmm. the, the narrative is so often that there's just going to be hordes of migrants in Europe. Exactly. And, and yeah. it's not productive, and it's you know it doesn't seem all all that. I mean, we need to understand all the people who stayed mm -hmm. and why they stayed and how they made sense of their new world mm -hmm. and pass that on to their children. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. And you put it so beautifully that um, part of this is to, I mean, you know, the complexity of human behavior is so difficult to predict. I mean, there isn't really a predictive skill, but uh, I mean, a predictive method that can tell us even no matter what economists say or, um, you know, other um, uh, human behavioral theorists. Um, and that, si that history is kind of the science of complexity that allows us to think about it, not give any definitive answers, but to really think about those complexities and try to, you know, think about why our own assumptions today may be wrong. So with that, I think I have to say it's seven o'clock and I know that people need to be places. Um, so I want to say thank you all for coming and thank you all to everybody um, virtually who joined us and please do join us on May 9th for our next event. Um, thank you all and have a nice evening.